The Forsaken is one of the few released sample chapters from The Winds of Winter, written by George R. R. Martin. Simply one of the most anticipated books ever. This specific chapter was only read live at Balticon, so big thanks to the fans who wrote the transcript for it. The point of view character here is Aaron Greyjoy, and he helps us learn more about how effed up his brother Euron actually is. But without further ado, prepare yourselves for an abridged animated version of The Forsaken. Let us skip the sewing and get right into the reaping. You're now watching Because Geek. The chapter starts with Aaron chained up in a dark dungeon. He doesn't know how long he's been here, or why he is here, or where he is exactly, but he knows that the person keeping him captive is Euron. The bastard's mutes had taken all of his clothes, including his breech clout. He is butt naked in a place where the tide is reaching up to his private parts. And Aaron isn't alone. I'm not talking about the rats that were biting him, or the lice and the worms crawling through his scalp and beard giving him a horrible itch that he couldn't scratch. I am talking about a bunch of other mutilated holy men who were in the same dungeon with him, sharing his torment. But things aren't all that bad. At least he's not going to die of starvation. Euron's mutes would bring him food every now and then. Crappy tasting food that Aaron would retch back up after, but it was food nonetheless. Euron would even come himself sometimes, and bring him wine to drink. Well, more like force Aaron to drink it, but it, it wasn't wine. Yeah. What was that thick, viscous thing? It tasted bitter and sour and sweet. It is the wine of the warlocks, Euron told him. And then, it hit him. He saw his brother Urigon first. His arm was rotting, swollen with maggots. But he was still a boy, just like the day he died. You know what waits below the sea, brother? Uri asked him. The drowned god. The watery halls. No. Worms. Worms await you, Aaron. Uri's image was then replaced by Euron, who was now standing on a mound of blackened skulls with a forest burning behind him. He was showing his blood eye, wearing scales dark as onyx, while dwarves skipped around his feet. This Euron also spoke, and told Aaron that the bleeding star foretold the end of the world that the world would be broken and remade, and a new god would be born from the bones of the dead. Euron then proceeded to blow a great horn, which brought dragons, krakens, and sphinxes to bow before him, at which point Aaron made his anger be known, that no godless man may sit the sea stone chair. But Aaron had been misled. Euron didn't want the sea stone chair, he wanted more than that. That was small thinking. Indeed, Euron was now sitting on a throne, but this throne was made of sharp barbs and blades and broken swords, upon which the bodies of all the gods were impaled, making a mess of themselves dripping blood all over the place. All the seven gods were there, including the stranger. Next to them were other foreign gods like the Black Goat, the Lord of Light, the Butterfly of Nath, among others. But there was one god that really caught Euron's eye. It was the Drowned God. Oh yeah, he was there too. Swollen, green, and half-devoured by crabs, it festered with the rest, seawater still dripping from his hair. This terrified Aaron, but thankfully, that was the end of that dream. He did piss himself, though, the poor guy. The last thing that Aaron remembered clearly was Euron's victory at the King's Moot, and Victarion's stubbornness in thinking that it was their god who chose Euron. Victarion would not listen, but Aaron knew his drowned god better than him. Surely Euron being king was not the drowned god's wishes. No, it was merely the wishes of drunken men who had sinned and chosen the wrong king. No worries, Aaron could fix this. He went into the sea to have a heart-to-heart -heart with the drowned god and figure out a solution. Victarion had been spurned by everyone and Asha had been cursed with a woman's body. She should have supported Victarion instead of making her own claim. The solution came easy then. All Aaron needed to do was to make Victarion take Asha for his wife. The rule that they couldn't have on their own, they could have together. Proud of his resolve, Aaron started making his way back to shore. And that was when the mutes caught him. He had been a prisoner ever since, although not always in the same place. He found out the location of his first dungeon when, strangely enough, a lovely lady came to bring him food instead of a mute. She claimed to be Falia Flowers, Lord Hewitt's natural daughter, and that they were on Oaken Shield. Yes, Aaron was on the Shield Islands. Falia also happily shared that she was to be King Euron's salt wife. Aaron feared for her, because he knew what kind of man Euron truly was. He did try to warn her, but it was no use. 
she wouldn't listen to him. She was so smitten with him and all the nice things that he had done for her. She was even already pregnant. Aaron gave up hope on her, but it was she who would make him give up hope completely. Aaron asked her to get a message to Victarion, and that's when she revealed to him that Victarion was long gone. He had gone to Essos to fetch the Dragon Queen and bring her to Westeros to be wed to Euron and become his rock wife. That was when Aaron realized that no one would ever come for him. Most people didn't even know he had been captured. His only escape left after that was death, but the tide wouldn't rise high enough to drown him. There was another time when Euron came to him while at sea on the silence. And that was the time when he confirmed to us, the readers, made a talk right now, the theory that Euron had molested his younger brothers, Aaron and Urigon. But not only that, he also confessed to having killed three other brothers, two half-brothers, Harlan and Robin, and his legitimate brother, Balon. Oh yes, he couldn't do the deed himself, he said, but it was his hand that pushed him off the bridge, confirming that other theory as well. He couldn't kill Aaron yet, though, Apparently, he needed Aaron's holy blood for something later. It was after that event, in the second dungeon, where the holy men began to appear. Three of them wore septon robes of the Greenlands, and Aaron suspected that they had their tongues cut out, judging from the noises that they were making. There was another, hardly recognizable as a man, with his hands burned down to the bone, who wore the red raiment of a priest of Relore, and the last two were warlocks of the East all skin and bones now. They had hung one of them from a rafter. The poor guy had lost his legs, and he cried the word pre. This is another confirmation to book readers of who he was. But Aaron doesn't know him, and he thinks that pre is the name of the demon that he worships. In the middle of his hopelessness, Aaron's fever dreams continue to be haunted by Urigon's ghost. That wasn't all, though. Euron came to visit him a second time, with more wine of the warlocks, which was called Shade of the Evening, ready to be shoved down Aaron's throat once more. But wait, wait, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. Other stuff happened before this. Aaron had noticed that Euron wasn't wearing his driftwood crown anymore, but an iron crown instead, with shark teeth for its points. What meaning there was in that, Aaron could not tell. But one thing was obvious. In Euron's mocking words, there was cunning. Euron claimed that victory was sweeter with a loved one by his side. That's another reason he didn't want to kill Aaron. But Aaron didn't believe in Euron's victories. He called them hollow. He might have taken the shields, but he could not hold them, he said defiantly. To which Euron cunningly replied that the victory of taking them would always belong to him, but the defeat of losing them would belong to the four fools he had gifted the islands to. Euron was several moves ahead of Aaron in more than one way. He had even given Asha's hand to Eric Ironmaker and left him in charge of the Iron Islands before he left. And now, with Aaron away, he wouldn't be able to preach against it. Alright, now back to the Shade. This time, it was worse than the last. Aaron saw the Ironborn longships adrift and burning on a boiling, blood-red sea. And he saw his brother Euron sitting on the Iron Throne again. But this time, his face was a mass of writhing tentacles that made him seem more like a squid monster than a man. And there was a tall and terrible shadow in the shape of a woman beside him with pale white fire on her hands. Male and female naked dwarves were biting and tearing at each other in carnal embrace at their feet while they both laughed. Those are just some of the things that had happened to Aaron before he got to this dungeon. And now here comes another mute to pay him a visit. But that's not food in his hands. It's a ring of keys. Was Aaron about to be freed? No, he was simply being taken somewhere else again, with the rest of the priests. It was when the mutes dragged him up the stairs and through a bleak stone hole on their way to the ship that he figured out where he was. There were corpses hanging from the rafters of that hall, and beneath them, a dozen of Euron's captains, drinking. In a disdainful way, they told Aaron that the dead were the lords of this castle, and that this was their isle, a rock just off the arbor. He had been moved from the shields all the way down to the arbor. Aaron was now farther away from home than before. After getting mocked some more by the captains, Aaron was dragged the rest of the way outside, and that's where he spotted Euron's flag for the first time. It was a red eye with a black pupil, beneath an iron crown supported by two crows. On the deck of the silence stood Euron Crow's eye, and Aaron was shocked to see that he was wearing a Valyrian steel armor, which was only known to exist before the Doom of Valyria and would have cost a kingdom. So it was true. Euron hadn't lied, he had been to Valyria, 
No wonder he was mad. He proved so even further when he gave the order to bind all the priests to the prows of the ships, saving a special spot on the silence for Aaron. But hey, at least Aaron wasn't alone. After sailing, Euron decided to bring him company. He tied a naked and pregnant Falia flowers to the prow next to Aaron. She even had her tongue cut out as well. And with that horrible image in our heads, the chapter comes to an end. We're left asking ourselves questions like, is this really how Aaron will die? Where is Euron heading to next? What was he doing with all those priests? And of course, the biggest question of all, what did those Shade of the Evening dreams mean? If you enjoyed this video, you will probably enjoy this one as well. And if you would rather watch videos about Game of Thrones Season 8, you can click on this one. And if you would like to watch me edit my videos, I'm going to be doing so on Twitch from now on. You can find links to my schedule in the description as well. Leave a like if you liked it, subscribe for more, and I will see you in the next one!